with us online, uh, we have Jack, Representative Handy, are you on board, Representative? Yes, I'm, I'm here, Gene. Uh -huh. Yes, I'm here. Great. Just welcoming everybody here. Uh, also, we have Cimbria and uh, the Commissioner, Clayton Butters, is here online. Yeah, here. <clears throat> welcome. Uh, we want to welcome you here. Uh, it was a great session. We got ourselves reauthorized to go for the local food advisory council to last another year. And of course, we sent out an, uh, an email questionnaire to every everyone, asked them to comment. We want to make sure that we've got the structure in place so we can really move forward in a way. Uh, I think the first term that we had, the uh, advisory council was really quite fruitful. Pretty uh, educational to me, where everybody was kind of into how we can get more things accomplished in the next uh, time. Uh, and I want to go to Representative Handy. If you want to say hello? Yes, I do want to say hello to all of you, and I, I apologize that I'm not there in person with you. I want to tell you that I'm in Denver right now uh, at an energy conference that I. You know, it, it, sometimes you choose between two good things and certainly a good thing that my, where my heart is to be with you today for this uh, this important meeting. Uh, but I felt that I could come here, too, and leave this in the hands of uh, the capable hands of Senator Davis and Callie and Linda and I and, and Senator Davis have done some deep planning and some looking at some things today and in preparation for this meeting. I want to tell you, I'm having kind of fun. I'm sitting here at Empower Field. It's where the Denver Broncos play. And I'm sitting here in a, um, a box seat looking out over the, uh, the stadium. And they're doing, as you can probably hear the construction. I'm sorry about that. They're doing a, some, one of these monster jams or monster truck things they're doing in preparation for that. They got a lot of dirt moving around. But I want to say something about the Local Food Advisory Council. It certainly is a labor of love for me uh, that we started uh, five years ago. Uh, some of you know that I've had a, a political setback and so that my term will be ending uh, on uh, December 31st of this year and uh, my legislative service. And I know that uh, uh, that is distressing a lot of you and I and it's distressing me. And I appreciate the kind sentiments and the words and uh, the encouragement that has been offered to me. And it, it's it, I really appreciate it. I wanted to say that this is a time for a reset for the Local Food Advisory Council. We need to, uh, to uh, relook at our mission. We need to look at, our, at what we're going to accomplish. We need to figure out what's going to happen. And, uh, and Dr., Dr. Kelsey Hall is going to uh, take us through a, uh, a, a, an exercise later in the agenda to kind of just help us flesh out some things. And we worked on the survey. I'm anxious to see the survey results. I apologize. I won't be able to be part of the discussion. But I want you to know that, that the Local Food Advisory Council will continue strong. Uh, Senator Davis has got to get through a primary, but we'll, uh, we'll, we'll have a, a strong legislative support going forward. And uh, things are going to be fine. And uh, it's going to take all of you uh, active and involved engagement to uh, make the Local Food Advisory Council even more relevant and more important. I, I continue to believe strongly, as I've learned over these last five years, the importance of supporting and uh, encouraging what I call the local food movement or the local food community. It's so vital and critical to our um, to our economy and to our, our well-being and our quality of life in Utah. And so what we're doing is a really important and a good thing. And thanks to Callie for her support and, and Jack Wilbur before uh, to, get us, to get us launched and started. So apologize again that I can't be here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sign off and go to my energy meeting that's starting right now. And um, I'm just going to wish you all the very, very best and look forward to uh, the minutes and, and the uh, discussing with, uh, with Senator Davis and others and Callie uh, how the meeting went today. So... Uh, things are going to be okay. Things are going to move forward, and uh, and uh, things are going to be great. But it's going to be in your hands to ensure that uh, we step up and really 
and really get forward in a in a great and important way. So, Gene, that's uh, those are my those are my comments, and uh, I'll turn the meeting to you. Thanks for letting me express that. Thank you, Representative. It's great to have you here, and uh, we wish you well. And we know that you'll be here at our June meeting when we meet next time. Yes, I will. Seeing you then. Also uh, online, uh, we have Ruby Ward with us. And welcome, Ruby. And uh, uh, Cimbria, I think, is on her way in. Yeah, she's, she's on her way in. She'll, yeah. be, she'll be up here in a, in a moment. She's listening in right now. So what I want to do next, we'll go to the roll call, follow the uh, agenda, do the roll call, and then uh, and the review of the minutes. Well, so I'll probably just for the recording, just state who's here and state who's not here just to make it easier. So in attendance in person, we have Garrett Call, Tamara Jorgensen, Kelsey Hall, Brad Belknap for Janae Duncan, Gina Cornea and Senator Jean Davis. Virtually, we had Representative Handy, uh, Commissioner Craig Butters, Jack Wilbur, and then not in attendance, Allison Einerson, Jordan Riley, Bjorn Carlson and Claire Collard. So we have a quorum. We can yes. We can proceed. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm, uh, has everybody had a chance to look at the minutes and review them? I'll entertain a motion. I would. This is Gina. I move that we accept the minutes from our December 2021 meeting. Thank you. Motion by uh, Gina Cornea to approve the minutes. Discussion to that uh, motion. Seeing none. All those in favor say aye. 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 Excuse me, I probably not followed Robert's orders and asked for a second due to the oh. fact that the legislative way we do things, we don't ask for seconds. So anyway, I will try to remember we're operating under Robert's rules. If that's okay. Can I hear a second? I'll second. Okay. Unanimous seconding of the opinion is well. okay. Thank you. Okay. As as I uh, mentioned at the beginning. There's a number of things we need to do there. One of the things we all have to fill out a conflict of interest form. And um, also those of you who are seeking reimbursement for uh, incurred expenses, uh, will have an explanation on how that is done. Yeah, so, I'll send you an email. If you will. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I will send you guys, we still are using the 2021 conflict of interest form because they haven't had to change anything. But I'll send that out to you guys. Um, our legal team has just asked that we collect that every year. Um, so I will be sending that out. If you don't have a conflict, no worries. Just put NA and then just sign it. Um, examples of conflicts are like, if you own a business that's regulated by Department of Ag, that's something that you'd want to put on there. So just anything that could potentially be connected with something else here. Um, there's a place at the bottom for signatures and asks for a witness. You don't have to get it like notarized or anything like that. It's literally just somebody who's over the age of 18 who just watched you sign it, who's of sound mind and can just confirm that you signed it. So that's what they told me there. Um, reimbursement. I know a lot of you who are eligible don't accept for various reasons, either lobbying or um, relationships. But I will send an email to voting members uh, about reimbursement, those who are eligible. Um, and then it's kind of a process. You have to fill out a human resources form for the state. I think that's why a lot of people don't <laughs> go after the reimbursement, but I can walk you through the process because um, we want to make sure if you're eligible, you can get those. And I just wanted to add one more administrative thing. Um, two members were added to the council. So we now are a 15 member council. Um, we are working on filling those. I, I know Lori Cerrone is in the process of being, uh, well, I guess, processed for a food distributor, for a food hub representative, but we do have one more that Senator Davis and Representative Handy are gonna consider what, what we need on the council. But just so you know, we are jumping from 13 to 15 voting members. So the second one has a, the sector that they represent has not been defined. Hasn't been identified. Okay. Nope, so if you have any commentary on your thoughts of what that should be, we felt very strongly that food distribution was really important, which is why we went with Lori. Uh, Sarone is a representative of SAPA. So if you have any thoughts, feel free to send them directly to me or Representative Handy, Senator Davis. Um, but just know that we will be getting two more members. So think of people you know. We'll we'll put that application out and I'll let you know when it's open. So that's it for me. Thank you. All righty. Rip right on down the agenda here. Yeah. 
So uh, local food purchase assistant cooperative agreement. Uh, Natalie, is Natalie here? So, Natalie, unfortunately, is sick and was unable to make it. However, Laura holtrop Cole is with the Department of Health and has been working closely with Natalie. So if we could turn it over to Laura, she's prepared. Okay, Laura, if you would, please. Yeah, is there a place I should be? Or just... You can present right up here so that you've got the camera to present to everyone. Um, yeah, this is pretty quick. I can hear <laughs> But yeah, so so Natalie and I um, at the Department of Health are working on an application that's a non-competitive USDA grant um, that is, the goal is to support um, disadvantaged local farmers um, and connect them with underserved communities. Um, and so there's the, there's the procurement side and then there's the distribution side. Um, and the state, I don't know if this is, but so the state, um, we has allocated $2.2 million for this, um, fit 60%, um, we at the state can apply for, and then 40% is saved for, um, the, um, government tribes in Utah. Um, and we're in conversation or trying to get in conversation with them. So anyway, um, that's kind of what we're talking about. Yes. Gina. <laughs> Thank you. Um, how how is disadvantaged farmers defined, and then specifically for Utah, what does that look like? That is a great question. Um, yes, yeah, so there is a definition, um, and it includes um, farmers in low income areas, veterans, young farmers, beginning farmers, um, um, BIPOC farmers. And anyone in the is that, um, protected class? Any protected class? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I, I think I, that I think that's all. So actually, one of the reasons we wanted to make sure that all of you knew that we were doing this, and we've talked to quite a few of you in the room, but um, we wanted to. We, we're going to need your help, or we're going to ask for your help to help us identify disadvantaged farmers. Um, but, but let me back up. So how, how we're doing this is our, our um, plan is to create an RFA um, that will be opened up at the beginning of 2023 um, for organizations to, um, to, to, to be sub-awardees. And that's the calendar year, not fiscal year of 2023? Correct. So. Yeah. It'll, well, it'll be around December, January where we put out the RFA. Yep. Um, yeah, we don't have the capacity to do a lot of the logistical work, and we're also not experts in this area. Um, so we're, yeah, we're we're relying on other people to really do this. As you look at yeah, disadvantaged farmers, yes. if I might, um, do we describe? Is is there an acreage thing to describe what what that is, or is it a person who's producing in their in a small lot? Mm -hmm. Do they have to have a greenhouse? What are we talking about when we're talking about? Yes, yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, that my first go to on this was, oh, we can just do small farmers, but that's actually not part of the definition. Um, I did that. That does remind me that urban farmers are in that category. Um, but this is going to yeah, this is going to be kind of a discussion and definition that we're going to have to work through. We had a question. Thank you. Um, are there limitations on how this money can be spent or guidelines for what this grant should be used for? Yes. So at, at minimum, 51% has to be spent on food. Um, and then the remaining can be spent on um, storage and distribution costs. Though it's kind of, you know, like all federal grants where we can't spend money on equipment or con permanent construction. Um, it can be, you can rent equipment um, or rent space. Um, yeah, we can get into the weeds on that. Um, like, kind of the short story is up to five thousand dollars. You can kind of work with. <laughs> yes. Are you using at all the USDA's definition of socially disadvantaged, beginning, limited resource, female farmer, biopic farmers, and stuff? Because they have like outlined by the amount of uh, gross sales that someone can have when um, they qualify for. 
the limited family resource side of it, and then how many years they've been farming to be a beginning farmer. And they have this amazing uh, break of parts for how to include all of the different areas. And I didn't know if that was in consideration in that definition. So I haven't heard of that, but um, I was, uh, Linda shared a resource with me that, that like gave us the stats on young farmers and beginning farmers in Utah, mm -hmm. but I didn't see the like total growth. It's the USDA's definition that we have to use for federal <laughs> NIFA grants. So if you okay. would like that information, I can share it with you because yeah. our farmer's market promotion program grant that we just wrapped up um, focused on also socially disadvantaged farmers if possible and what that looks like. So I didn't know oh, if it helps okay. at all because it can really give some guidelines for your application and who might, and it's very like open, I think, to a lot of areas, but that could be a good start. And that could be a great start. Um, that's what we were hoping existed. And yeah. Thinking aloud here a moment, maybe this is one of those subcommittee issues that we can bring up when we start putting our subcommittees together kind of brainstorm this with people with your input on how how we need to structure this so that just an idea there yes yeah i just wanted to tag on with one um extra fun thing there's basically a parallel cooperative agreement with funding to do pretty much the same thing for schools and so utah state board of education is going to be applying for that and we are in conversation with our schools on exactly what that's going to look like but it's very similar that there's like I think that allocation is like $1.8 million and it's to buy unprocessed food from socially disadvantaged farmers and then distribute it equi equitably, including to our tribal schools. Um, so just stay tuned. Like we're in the, the beginning stages right now where we're figuring out how to best benefit the schools from that. But um, the one thing that's a tighter timeline, it's only we have one year to, to do that one. So it'll probably be just like a big push and then done. Um, okay. Okay. I'm sorry, how much do you say that was? I think it's 1.9 million. Okay. That's for school, school food. Program. Yeah, it's a, it's like basically the same idea as this um, local food purchase, but the money, the food has to go specifically to the school food programs instead of just to the community. So we're gonna we're gonna make sure that we're not like competing over farmers or anything. And it's disadvantaged farmers. It is, yeah. It's oh, okay. Yeah, kind of. That's interesting. Thing. That's that's one of the great things about having this committee is bringing this kind of discussion together. Where we can really address it, and I think we, we, that's probably one of those subjects that we want to take a deep look at during during this uh, interim study area to see what we need to do. Also, in the legislature coming up next January, so if we need to do anything there, so hey, this would really be great. Uh, do you know a timeline for when that program starts for schools? Um, the RFA is due. The grant application is due June seventeenth. And then they're accepting them as they come in. And then once you get it, you have you have a year. Um, we're not going to get it in before June seventeenth. <laughs> it's going to be that week. So, yeah. Um, but so yeah, let's start with the twenty two twenty three school year. You think? Yeah, I mean, I think depending on how we're going to do it, we're looking at a couple couple possibilities. One is we may pass the funding through directly to schools and have them procure on their own. I don't know that they have those capabilities, especially when we're targeting socially disadvantaged farmers. Mm -hmm. So we may also like pick a few products to highlight and then we as the state agency would contract with those farmers and the schools would just get an allotment that they yeah. ordered from them. Um, but yeah, it would basically all be during this that next school year, the 22-23 school year. Okay. Um, it's I heard on a webinar the other day, I guess it's because they had some extra ARPA funding that they reallocated and it had to go specifically to food purchases and it had this expiration date. So that's why it's a, like a little bit of a wonky thing where they're like, we want you to build sustainable relationships uh -huh. with local producers in a year. Um, so. easy, easy, okay, come yeah. back. <laughs> it's better than that. It's a good problem to have. <laughs> well, and the timing could work really well. So um, our application is due May 6th, but then we're, um, our start date is flexible. And so, like I said, it won't yeah. start until 2023, and it's a two-year. Yeah, um, so it might just be like this is like a, teasing into it with some of the farmers, and then they'll be ready to go for you guys. <laughs> It's going to be an interesting discussion, I can see, uh -huh. as we put this together. And I think that's probably both of these programs, something we probably want to add to our agenda for updates as we go forward uh, with our meetings. Do you have a question? 
Okay, you're looking with such an interest there. No, I'm, 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 I'm trying to figure this whole thing out. Right. <laughs> trying to figure out the timeline. That seems like a fast turn. Yeah. It, it always is. is. It always yeah, is. It's a fast, <laughs> oh, yeah. it's a fast <laughs> moving train. And what? Deadlines? When's your deadline? But the application is May 6th. It's May? Yes. Just a week away, two weeks away. Two weeks away. Two weeks and away. Yours is about a month away, yeah. a month and a half, month six and a half, weeks. Yeah. So we have, we've had had good discussions with like Congress of Utah and the food bank, so a lot of people are aware of it. Um, can we? See, could you share information electronically to us? Because I have a list serve of all the small scale, medium scale farmers, and they have signed up for the USU Extension list serve. And uh, Ruby more would know more about that. But we can send out messages to farmers, and then we could use it on our social media. And then I can think of a few Facebook messages pages that I use for getting out the word to farmers in our state when we have programming or grants or topics going beyond just our commodity organizations, but actual um, group pages that are just directed to farmers and having their conversations. Yes, so I, happy to I would like to help that. spread the word Definitely. if that's possible. And that's what, yes, that, that's, yes, we want that to okay. happen. We, we don't have those materials specific to Utah yet, mm -hmm. but we will for sure. Okay. Well, yes. also so share that, do, I I'll think. help blast it out. Awesome. Thank you. To our Facebook page as well. Yep. I would like to be able to do that yep. post, and I can do that for you. Great. I can Thank design you. something and get it posted. <laughs> Um, I, would, I would just maybe add, as far as this program goes, that the turnaround is May 6th for the application, but we have a lag period to actually build those relationships. We are giving ourselves a six-month period to build the relationships, both with producers, to identify producers, but also on the flip side, we need to have organizations who have the capacity to purchase from producers and distribute to communities in need. So like Laura had mentioned, we've had conversations with some already, like Farmers Feeding Utah, the Utah Food Bank, other organizations. But really at this point, that's where our mind's at is looking at making those connections. So on both sides for producers and for organizations who can purchase that food. But this program's a great opportunity because it covers the cost of the food, it covers the cost of the storage, of transportation. So everything needed logistically, hopefully, to get that food from point A to point B should be covered by this grant. That's the importance that we find in trying to create a food hub it's mm. because they have that distribution point and being able to get to enough produce for schools to be able to distribute and use and, and for the health department to be able to use to get out to the needy people that need that food. So I know Ron Johnson had indicated to me in a conversation, he said, Boulder Ranch down in uh, Boulder, Utah, as a matter of fact, and what he's talked about is getting a lot of farmers together and kind of creating a co-op to kind of spread that out and, and, and so that they have a place to drop their food off and then be collected. So those are some of the things I think that we're working on here that I think could just coordinate into this whole thing and make it very, very effective and make us work very, very well. That's what I love about this is the synergy that is created by discussion. Yes. I have a couple more questions, Laura, but maybe you and I can just, I mean, since. Yeah, I don't think to, we're given much time for this yeah. on the agenda. But yeah, if anyone wants to have full conversations, um, Natalie and I and Brad would love to do that. And we'll put a standing update for both of you guys on these grants. What's the school one called? This one's Local Food for Schools. Local Food for Schools. Yeah. Super clever. Wow. Yeah. Are they AMS? No, they're yeah, it's a, it's a commodity credit corporation. So yeah, through AMS. It's basically the same thing as that one. Just for schools. Just for schools. Okay. I'll put that on the agenda. Thank you. Okay, I, I guess that brings us down to what happened in January and February, early March. What happened at the legislature? What did we accomplish? And what didn't we on behalf of uh, the uh, of our advisory board? Uh, number one is, uh, of course, we were reauthorized. We did win on that one. And I think I'll turn it over to Kelly to kind of give us an update, if you will, of on the farm to school appropriation, if you would. And I know what happened to the food. Yeah. So. Well, farm to school, I don't know, Kate, Linda had to excuse herself. I'm sorry, Linda meant to do the. No, that's okay. okay. I can do that one. Yeah. Um, so we had a farm to school bill, and the idea was to really institutionalize farm to school at the state agency level. It would have 
um, made my position at USBE official, so that in case you have a change of director or whatever, there's still a farm to school position in our agency, and then it would have created parallel positions at Department of Health and at Department of Ag, and um, then made those positions into a farm to school commission that would sort of oversee, we have a state farm to school network, but this would have given it some official leadership so that it's not just, <laughs> just me. Um, and then I got through the house really well and then um, really struggled in the Senate committee and, and ended up failing there. I think partly um, there was a lot, there were a lot of folks in that committee who just didn't understand what we were doing um, and they didn't understand why. And I think that you know, we could have done a better job of harnessing the power of this network um, to really help with that education part way in advance. Uh, I think part of it too, there's people on that committee who, if I, I love educating people about farm to school and why it's important, but they're not necessarily going to hear me because they see someone who <laughs> lives in an urban area. It doesn't, like, they don't see me as somebody who understands, you know, big ag or anything like that. So I do think if we do this next year, we need to, I mean, we need to really educate people on that committee well, well in advance. And we need to find the people that they're already ready to listen to um, and really, really use that to help them understand why this is, why it's beneficial and why it's a good idea. Because I understand why there's so much reticence towards, um, you know, people are just like, oh gosh, you're expanding the government. That's terrible. We can't do that in Utah. And I think we had a lot of success in the houses framing it as an issue of like, really what I do in my role right now is help people navigate all the regulations that are in place because it seems so obvious that like farmers have food and schools need food. Why aren't they talking? Oh, because there's all these barriers and someone has to help like kind of work you through the maze and get you connected. Um, and I think we just weren't able to communicate that piece to, to the members of the Senate committee. And so I think making sure that they understand like that this isn't a position intended to like make, make new regulations or or make it harder. It's to help people who already want to do this work through what they need and give them that support and that training. Um, but yeah, I do think that we really need to to be strategic about that from probably starting now if we wanted to, to do that next. To year. add on to that, because we met to talk about this, a few of us met for strategic planning, and one thing that was suggested, which I'm really excited about, we'll talk a little bit more later, is we actually want to host. I can't think of, like, for lack of a better word, like a retreat for for certain legislators that are, like, either the committee or something like that, because I feel like Jack can attest, too, since he took this over, it's, like, the same problem is they just don't understand what we're trying to do, and it just, which is, I mean, understandable, they're not in it every day, but we have talked about maybe, what was it, October, or was it, like, I think it was October. We, September, October, meeting with them. Uh, yeah. Basically, the leadership is to really sit down and, and Go over what we're trying to do, what we're trying to accomplish. Try to educate them a little bit quicker in the curve instead of throwing things at them as a bill as the committees meet. So it's really putting it in and getting our ducks in order better to be able to do it. Representative Handy carried that bill. Yeoman's job in doing it, it was came down to the last minute where the Appropriations Committee just didn't understand what it was all about. So there needs to be better articulation on, on, on our side as legislators to the committee to be able to really get them to buy into what we're trying to do. Well, I think they're, you know, during the session, there's just so they're just taking in so much information. And so even if you have like the perfect materials and the perfect presentation, like they probably get 3% of it because there's just so much other stuff going on that I think a a retreat or you know doing something that is separate like that is a really great idea when you look at the appropriations for ag and natural resources and department of environmental quality are all buying for the same amount of dollars and the same programs so it's a little difficult to be able to get all of these things together you've got parks under natural resources you've got fire suppression you've got so many different issues that need to be addressed by that committee and, and to try to find the funding for it uh, sometimes becomes very, very difficult and it's ending up actually going to the Executive Appropriations Committee uh, and, and really twisting their arm pretty hard. And of course, this wasn't a department ask either, so it wasn't something that the department had in the governor's budget to be able to do that. So I know we're committed to do that again. I think that's one of the things we're going to work on with the subcommittee so we come down with a good ironclad idea of what we're going to request when we sit down with uh, 
the management of, of the appropriations. So, Senator, is, is there a chance to get that on the interim agenda and have, have some discussion in interim? I'm just wondering if that's a better time to educate and discuss it. The biggest problem with uh, an interim committee is we can get it into an interim committee, but to get it on a special session, no, because it deals with the budget. Right, right. So we and we can't deal with the budget in a special session unless it's an emergency. The and session the starts at interim, so then we're familiar with it. We are, and we'll be trying to get that on interim. In fact, we'll try to get a good time to be able to get everything that we've come up with done from this uh, uh, council to be able to carry forward to the legislature in our report at the end of the year, which will be in October or November. When we won't get that report. And to add to that too, Simbria, I know she's driving, but one comment Simbria had, and we'll talk about that when we go to the survey, but a lot of us are limited and not able to lobby, but a lot of people can lobby. So Simbria was talking about like, for example, when that bill is being discussed in the Senate, how powerful would it be to have like our whole local food army there that can lobby versus just having a couple, which is nice to have a couple, but Simbria had mentioned like, man, it would have been so nice to have the whole army there, just everyone there and just showing all these people. Um, so we're gonna work on that. He's gonna, uh, Senator Davis is gonna talk more about our structure, but one thing that has come up in a lot of surveys and emails from all of you guys is leveraging what abilities we have to be there. So that was the specific example is more of us could have been there. Lobbying is really great. And the one thing that we don't have time, of course, on appropriations committee, I can tell you is a lot of time to be able to do presentations because there's so many that comes before the committee that it's just a rapid fire maybe two or three minutes explain what you want it's, it's an elevator approach to, to appropriations it's really what it is in all of these committees and so it's education is, is really the key behind behind the scenes to be able to make this example okay and, and the food hub appropriation that was basically the same thing there were those on executive appropriations where I tried to push it through. They looked at it and they said, well, isn't the food bank taking care of all of this right now? <laughs> Not the answer. same thing. Yeah. And I tried to explain it to them and I, I got through to one or two and then they come back and it's, well, let's, let's take, you know, can't that be done by, doesn't the Farm Bureau do that every, every year when they go to the fairgrounds or someplace like that and unload all of this food? And the answer there is, no, that's not what it's about. It's about getting food. And I finally characterized it to Senator Stevenson, and he seemed to get it when I said, you know, this is about the ugly fruits and vegetables, the ones that you plow under at the end of the season because you can't get them to the marketplace because they're not round enough, firm enough, and looking really, really great. So this is really about how do we take and I characterize it as the ugly fruit and vegetables, and how do you get that to market? The other issue, of course, we have is the harvesting of animals and how to get them into the pipeline and how to get those done. And a food hub can handle all of that yes. and, and have the distribution at the same time to where it's needed, be it at, uh, at the schools, be it at food pantries, places like that that can help not compete with the food bank, but actually augment the food bank and get out to people a little bit better. As we know, produce and meat spoil quickly, uh, and a food hub can have the kitchen prepared to be able to do all of these things ahead of time to get those done. And I don't believe uh, the food bank has a kitchen or a way of processing things into the system. So if they do have like a like they break down dry product, but not right. that other kind of stuff. And I mean, I think that. I know the Utah Food Bank has a warehouse down in St. George, and they're working on getting a facility up in um, San Juan. San Juan County. But you know, I mean, this isn't just about getting food to food pantries and food banks. And I think that, I mean, yeah, it, I mean, it's just amazing how, like, when you just live with this stuff in your head every day, and then you try and explain it, how it confuses people. <laughs> And you know, having centralized locations with the food bank and that distribution system is fine, but it's not going to work even on a smaller scale because sometimes it's very difficult 
because we get at Utah's Against Hunger, we get calls all the time from people who've asked the Utah Food Bank about distrib you know, distributing product, but they have to have it in such volume that they often turn food away. And a food hub could really be an excellent alternative when it's a smaller amount of, you know, a product or it's, you know, it's not located where the Utah Food Bank could even take it. So, and of course, fresh food and uh, fruit and vegetables uh, to the schools could be distributed better through a hub than farmers trying to deliver it to each and every school district to be able to do that. Anyway, I, I, I think there's been some education in there. The one thing is, is there's an election coming up and we don't know who's going to be there uh, and who will be running appropriations, who will be running the legislature basically until after uh, the middle of November before those assignments and some of those committee assignments won't be made until late December. So there could be some turmoil in, in doing that. That's the reason we need to educate as many people as we can between now and then. Um, now the appropriation to the Utah Farmers Market, I believe that was adopted and- Kelsey, do you know about that one? I was told it was failed. Yeah, right yeah. Yeah. That failed also. Yeah, that's failed. It failed. Yeah. yeah. That's right. That, 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 <laughs> that was that request uh, that- uh, $25,000 tacked on to what Utah State University was working with our legislator on, but really the priority for them was the vet school. I mean, even the extensions program only supported the vet school this year. And so there was no other ask. Well, we're supporting the network though in other ways as faculty to continue the effort because that was a farmer's market promotion grant that I wrote with Ross and Brain. And we hired Reagan as a colleague to that three year grant. And so um, they're looking at farmer's market promotion grants or looking at um, continuing on uh, the, the diversity, equity, and like inclusion work that we did through the network. They're still supporting that. I know I'm providing some support in different ways and uh, Reagan's still working uh, with uh, our principal investigator, uh, Rosa McCain on just like transitioning that network more to the farmer's market managers and getting their organization and their meetings and things like that handled. So we're going to be better at speaking on that, but um, there's still going to be continued support and work with them. It's Hannah Martin and I've been doing a few things for them. Yeah. It was my observation that this year the appropriations process was very opaque. I mean, it just over time, I mean, each year it just seems to be less and less transparent. And I think that us developing more relationships with legislators and leaning on organizations like the Utah Farm Bureau who have, you know, maybe some more inside relationships than my Utah and Sunder has. I mean, presumably. We're, we're like, there. I don't know if we have the relationship. Well, I know. But, but I'll tell you this you year. You have the one-on-one -on -one relationship yeah. with a lot of important you. <laughs> this year, I think, was the toughest. Mm -hmm. appropriation year to sort of grapple with. I mean, so like our, you know, Senator Escanillas asked for $500,000 for the um, the food pantries and food banks. You know, I mean, that was solid until 72 hours before the end of the yeah. session. So, I mean, I think the $27 that should... billion dollars that we spent, I can tell you, it's more money than we ever had on the table in my career. And yet it was a very, very tough year to figure out where that was going to go. Well, yeah, it, there was, was just, there was zero transparency. And it seems like the rules were changing on an hourly basis. And having, I think, legislative champions for any of these yeah. and future issues will be critical. I mean, I, I don't yeah. know. It just, it was a very frustrating year in the, the terms of appropriations. The thing with the pantry food, uh, Senator Escamilla was trying to get. And the thing that that ended up with, well, the food bank takes care of all of that. Well, which, yeah, we found. So, right. I mean, that was that was an excuse out. <laughs> well, of course it was because we told them, like, yeah, it, yeah. I mean, you know, it, it, it's an excuse. One of the things that I find really hard to get my colleagues to look at is the fact that we do have a hunger problem in the state of Utah. 
-hmm. We really do. When you take a look at just about every high school now has a pantry. Every junior high has a pantry. Every elementary school has a laundromat. I mean, these are these are showing that there's some real problems socially in our fabric that we need to address. Well, and it's a health and a human resource issue that we just have to address sometimes. Well, and I think that they even if they acknowledge that there is food insecurity and hunger, legislators think that the local LDS bishop is taking care of it and that the pantry is taking care of it. And what I think that we need, and, and I say we, and including Utahns Against Hunger, need to do a better job of is helping people connect the dots that if you're paying 70% of your income for housing, how do you afford food, especially if you don't qualify for federal nutrition programs, mm -hmm. or if you live in a community that has a pantry who has to close because they don't have the resources to stay open. And I think that that is, you know, I think that's a huge gap that we need to start feeling and thinking about how to connect those dots for legislators. Figure out a way to put it together. It's true. Okay, let's uh, move on the agenda. And Kelly, you, you want to give us an update on what happened? Is how many here filled out the survey? We've got ten. 10 results. 10 results. It was only sent to members. Uh, it was voting only sent voting. to voting members, by the way. Not so, so if you didn't receive a copy and you're not a voting member, you understand. Why. So 10 out of 13 voting members are members that completed it then? Well, That's plus non-voting. Plus non-voting, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so not as much engagement as we would have wanted, but we still got a lot of really good stuff. So if you want to pull up the presentation. So as Jared's pulling that up for me, I just wanted to, a couple of comments uh, as we go into the survey. You know, ever since we found out about Representative Handy, we've had a couple of strategic planning meetings. I know Kelsey joined in on one and Linda's been there just trying to figure out how to move forward. Also too with being reauthorized and also adding two additional members. So trying to plan strategically. We're also coming out of meeting two years in a row virtually, um, which is really different from meeting before. Um, I've gotten a lot of feedback from different voting members, non-voting members in the public, different criticisms about how we're running the council, different suggestions for improvement, things like that. So we met because we really wanted to kind of reset the council. And Senator Davis is going to go over this second handout that we put together for you guys. As part of the resetting, we wanted to do a survey to make sure that we were on the same page, that the ideas that we had for a reset are the things that the members were thinking things that you guys wanted to see um, happen. You know, the, one of the biggest things that we want to do and kind of what we mentioned with the legislature is we just want to build a bigger local food advisory council community. So this council is really unique to other government councils. It's not often that we welcome public comments, but we really do. We want the public involved in work groups. We want the commentary, we want the discussion. So it's a really unique government council as far as councils go. Um, one thing that we've done is we'll have this meeting room again next time, but the meeting room that we have in August is huge. And we did it that way because we want more people. We want public, we want, I wrote, I wrote some things down. We want more representation from minority communities. We definitely need that. We want more county representation, farmers markets, um, people who are in your constituency, like people that you guys work with definitely and we'll go over the survey, but definitely more producers, much more producers and distributors and things like that. So we're kind of going to build it and hope that they come. But that meeting room can hold, I don't know how many, a lot of people, like probably over 100 people in that meeting room. And we can set it up how we want it. So that's in two meetings from now. We're hoping to get that way. But anyway, that's how we got to this. Um, some other things that are coming that aren't going to be mentioned on this handout by Senator Davis. We are going to be working on a financial policy. Um, to allocate the funding a little bit better. So to be able to host things like outreach to legislators or retreats to bring people in or taking us out somewhere to farmers markets, things like that. We want to look at doing more paid advertising, not just on Facebook, but um, I know Senator Davis and Representative Handy, you guys wanted to look at the Farm to Fork. Is that what it's called? Farm Utah to Farm, Farm to Fork magazine. magazine. From Utah Farm Bureau. With Garrick and, and paying to put something about the local food advisory council. So 
I think the big thing to remember when we go through the survey is although we have a brand and we are this council, the council really is all of you. It's, and it's each individual thing that you guys are doing. And that's what we care about, care about sharing. Um, so go ahead to the next slide. Quick overview. It was just a short survey, eight questions. We just sent it through MailChimp. Voting and non-voting members were given the opportunity to respond. We received 10 responses. So I'm going to go over a couple of the questions that were short answer, some of the answers that we got, and then I put together some kind of rudimentary, like fifth grade level word clouds to do this to show you guys. But one of the questions we asked was, now that this council has been reauthorized, what would you like to see happen over the next five years? And I can honestly say all the answers that we got were exactly what, what Representative Handy and Senator Davis and Linda and I talked about in discussion. So really the first one is, Discussion, listening, and goal setting. Goal setting was a really common theme in the answers. Um, setting goals as a council, but also setting goals individually, things to come back to the council with. A huge commentary among all the questions was stronger connection with farmers and ranchers. So lots of commentary on, first of all, needing more present here in the discussion. We need more feedback and insight from them, but also kind of exploring opportunities to help farmers help Utah. So kind of keep that cycle. Um, we had a really good response about helping them profitably. So finding a way to help farmers profitably help Utah residents. So it's that, kind of that mutual benefit. And that was a good point. Some of the focuses that were mentioned were agritourism. We haven't really brought agritourism in very often, but that was a good one. Uh, drought and irrigation. That's one that's come up a lot, um, especially now. Things are kind of getting worse in that in that way. So drought and irrigation, uh, food security, which lines up well with one of our new work groups, which we'll talk about. And then the comment I really liked was timely topics. So that's another thing as well that we really rely on the council. You know, me and all my colleagues who are sitting here helping. I mean, we work for government, which is great, but government in some ways is generally a couple of years behind in data and things like that. So really, the topics that should be put on the agenda should come from you guys. You guys should inform us of what's going on because we're we're not in the community as much as we'd like to be. I mean, you know, we're in grant applications and then things like that, but that's not quite the same. So the timely topics one I really liked because, you know, we want to make sure what we're talking about here is relevant and is what we need to focus on. Mm -hmm. Which and this is I'm sorry no, for um, I think this seems like the appropriate time. Yeah. Um, what can the local food advisory do around bringing attention to the farm bill, which is supposed to be reauthorized in 2023. Yeah. yeah. For lobbying or do you mean? Well, no, I, you know, the, the, we did a, it's, this has been a while. I mean, I can't remember which farm bill it was now. That's how long I've been doing this. It's like, now which one was it? Not about the 20, no, it was, I think it was before 2018. Utah's Against Hunger hosted a farm bill forum with i mean we had we had somebody from each one of the titles represented and we did a panel discussion and had i think former mayor wilson of from salt lake was our moderator and we had somebody from each one of, who could represent the issues on each one of the titles talk about what it was why it was important and what role we could play and why it was important to utah I feel like that would be an excellent role for the local food advisory to do because like if Utah's Get Hunger does a farm bill forum, sort of the usual suspects, people are gonna think it's just about food security, but it really is about the whole food system and would could be a really excellent opportunity to bring in voices and identify um, some of the folks that we might not always work with. You said that's 2023. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but things are starting to happen yeah. now. And, and that is something that Utah's Against Hunger, I mean, I can commit us to working on if we decided as a council we wanted to do a Farm Bill Forum. There are great models out there, and that is something Utah's Against Hunger could totally help with. Yeah. I'll look at the finances because. From the financing perspective of the budget that we have for the council, I talked to Amber Brown, our policy person about it, and she said we can kind of write it how we want. We can write the financial policy. So I could write something, because you guys will vote on it. I could write something about events and things like that. 
Um, from what she said, we're not super limited in that regard. I don't, I don't see any limitations based on, do you no. see any limitations to do something like that? There's not any real limitations. Yeah. I mean, uh, for us to be able to help sponsor it with the underwriting in the community, uh, uh, and when I say that, the help of the Utah Scouts Tonker, maybe the Farm Bureau and other organizations, mm -hmm. maybe Utah State University as well, mm -hmm. uh, is, is to be able to do that and, and put it in more of a global form yeah, of what yeah. we're doing. And I think that might be very, very helpful going forward. And it would give us a lot of visibility. Totally. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, it would be, I it, I just guess, because we had, I think we broadcast it, had it broadcast on KUER or KCPW, now I can't remember. But I mean, it is, it is just ripe with a lot of possibilities to get some visibility, not only on the council, but on the issues that we all work on and start helping people make the connections about the overlap and really like, the um, intersectionality of that bill. And from a lobby point of view, if I might, we can go back to the school food program. We can go back to the health department's food program, how we get food to, to uh, underserved individuals and how we help the farmer, the underserved farmer, be able to get their products to market. I mean, all of this stuff can come in there where we can show understand what the problem is here it, or lay out the problem mm -hmm. show where we're working on some of those solutions and maybe some of the solutions are already in the process where they're actually being addressed yes yeah i mean i think that's a fantastic idea and i think part of that too we talk about how people just don't know anything about agriculture and mm -hmm. i promise you the average utah resident has no idea what the farm bill encompasses and how many pieces of their life it touches. The um, <laughs> vast majority of people do I mean, not I, know I grew up in agriculture what the farm bill does like, or how it impacts their lives. So I think it could make it could be a really, really incredible educational opportunity. Yeah, it is. The farm it's a lot of stuff, which is glorious, but it's interesting. It's called the farm bill. Right. Well, because great because SNAP used to be when his mom was teaching about food. Yeah, yeah, exactly. She asked him where corn came from. He says, big boss. <laughs> so everything he all the vegetables she was trying to trying to tell him, teach him about, they were all growing a big paws farm mm -hmm. or backyard, I should say. Sorry, farm. So let me there. check with Thank Amber you. really. Anyway, quick. yeah, sorry, I didn't I'll, mean to be no, that's okay. That no, seems like this, is, this, is, yeah. this is the one thing I love about this council. Is in fact the synergy that is created. The ideas that come forward and how everybody jumps in with with solutions and, and wanting to participate to make something small grow big and uh, and that's what i love about this and that's really the energy that is here and i can tell you uh, representative handy and i and and uh representative collar are the only three members of the utah state legislature that actually have an assignment that takes place with this uh, with the different organizations here, as well as in the ag department, to really understand what's going on and be able to advocate out of out of the ag department. So one thing is, we're only producing 15% of the food in Utah locally. We need to bring that up, especially with the challenges that we face going into the future. And uh, you know, and our hunger problem is not cured except through accepting diversity in the state and how we're going to address and how we're going to feed the diverse population that we have. So that, that's a challenge. To all. So I'll talk to Amber and just see, usually what happens is there's just a few of us who can't be involved depending on how things go, but I'll talk to her about the rules and then maybe we lump it into one of the work groups. That's not yeah, good idea. although I would, I, I mean, I would say, maybe we could have an ad hoc group Ad hoc or yeah, or the yeah. Or, right because i don't think it fits neatly into any of those four and i i want it to selfishly i want it to be broader than just focusing on access to snap because i think the more buy-in you get for the, for the farm bill as a whole mm -hmm. and have you know seeing the the entirety of it rather than it by titles so that would be i think having an ad hoc group might be a better approach okay cool let's take a look at putting it together then yeah maybe at our june meeting we can come back together Perfect. think about this for a couple of months and then we'll come back and, and 
have that on the All agenda. The Cool. Right. Thank you for letting me. Yeah, of Thank course. You. Okay, so a couple other things. One big one was more activity engagement from engagement from council members. You know, it's really tough to come off of meeting virtually and meet in person, and people are at different areas in the, in the state. But that was uh, feedback from basically everyone who responded. But not only engaging more from council members, but also engaging more with legislators, as we talked about, and also the governor's office, which isn't something we've done outside of Commissioner Butters and Kelly's connection, and then engagement in work groups. Um, and then another comment that was made was about working together and pooling our resources rather than competing. That's not a huge, huge problem with this council, but a lot of us have different resources and people kind of get sent all over the place for resources. So this is kind of the idea of bringing everything together uh, and sharing with everyone what they have. Next slide. So this was the word cloud. So I kept food. Um, I took food out of the other ones because it's kind of obvious, but I liked that food, a lot of comments about food and food security and sustainability and production and distribution. So I think that's good. We're all on the same page. We still are supporting food. I liked that local was another one that was said several times, um, farmers, information, things like that. So next question. Another question we asked was, where do you see improvements needed and what are your suggestions for improvements? Um, I took a direct line from one of the responses, which was to set tangible, real goals. That was a big theme when we met all together for strategic planning for the session was just, what are those goals? Is it to have more people at the session? Is it to have more bills sponsored? Is it to host more, you know, outreach? Is it those types of things? What are our goals? This is, as one of many of you have identified, this is a great place for discussion, but where can we take that discussion outside of this room? Um, I like the idea of outreach to determine needs and how to best help producers. So again, it hasn't identified, we don't have enough producers here. You know, I think we only have, I mean, Garrick, you probably produce, Tamara, you do too, but we don't have a lot of farmers and ranchers in the room, even value added food producers, manufacturers we don't have in the room. So there's this commentary about how can we help them if we don't know what their needs are. So really pulling them into these meetings, pulling them in as members of the public and getting their feedback one comment that I thought was actually really good, and we've talked about it as a team and our team kind of agrees, the time between our October meeting and our April meeting is really long. Now, it's kind of tough because the holiday season and then the session, but you know, maybe there we can talk about it, but maybe we need to add another meeting. Mm -hmm. There's nothing that says we can't have another meeting, right? We can have as many as we think we need. We talked about having more communication, but there was a thought that October to April is just so long that balls just kind of get dropped. Um, so that's well, something, and it, and it and it prevents us from organizing around the session. legislative yeah. issues. Yes. Ahead, so having like one, having one in January, yeah, I think you know because the, the session does start late into in, in January. I think that there would be time for another meeting. Yeah, you know, I I agree with you. I really believe that we serve also on the sentencing commission, and they meet. They actually meet in January to finalize their agenda for the upcoming session. And then the committee also meets members of it. Uh, I don't because I'm busy. But during the session, they actually have updates with the commission on what's going on and following that legislation. And that may be something we, we need to do depending on what, we're, what our agenda is moving into the session. And that's probably to put together uh, uh, a list that the members and, and those who attend our meetings could actually see online where we're moving and where we need help so that we keep it updated throughout the session as well. We, and that's just monitoring what's going on. It's not lobbying. Right. So that's what we had talked about with maybe the regulations group is having them be kind of like the here's the update. This is going through today at this time mm -hmm. here. You can be here. So we, we talked about that with the regulations group updating. And, and just knowing like times and places and what's going through. Um, so I think January, we can talk about January, but yeah. um, in theory, January would probably work. I mean, it works for me. It'd be quick around post the holidays, but didn't they move the session back a week or was it well, forward a week? It actually, it forward. Yeah. we moved it forward. It starts uh, now the day after Martin Luther King's birthday, which is the third, the third week of, uh, of January. So we have two-ish weeks that we can play yeah. with there? Of course. There's basically, we, if we could all pull together that first week after the new year, first full week after the yeah. new year, 
would probably be the time to be able to do that. I think everybody's back from holiday breaks that they've been taking and they're getting into the new year. So let's take a look at that. And as we move forward this this season, we will take a look at being able to do that and, and try to monitor where we're at and how how much synergy we really have going forward to be able to do that. Yeah, I recall going to January meetings in the past. I don't know if it was just because I was following the Red Anchor Center or if it was because I, you know, got invited to lunches or whatever it was, but I remember uh, being involved in the past in January and it, it was much better, actually, much better. You have more energy to going forward into the session instead yes. of blindly entering the room. Exactly. Cool. Yeah. Great. Okay, so then there was one too. This is something that we talked about. Obviously, we're going to have a replacement for Representative Handy as much as none of us want that to happen. Um, but one thing we talked about with that coming is to have better coordination with our legislators and the council. So better court like I guess leverage is the better way of like leveraging their resources, leveraging our resources and having that connection. Um, educating them, we talked about that, educating the legislature to better understand basically anything that we do, but obviously farm to fork, food insecurity, local food solutions. And then we talked about paid ads, so go to the next slide. So this one for improvement members was the biggest council members. So just really more engagement, um, pulling the right people in and again, this council is such a public council. We want recruitment. We want people to come. We want to grow this council. And that would kind of lump under members for us. Next one. Another question we asked was really how to add more values to our efforts. What should we be doing that isn't currently being done? I loved the top comment that was made of establishing food advisory councils in other counties. I think, you know, Kelsey's going to present to us today about best practices among other councils. That's a common thread in other states is having food advisory councils in other counties or other cities or other regions of and the state. And build them on, because there are so build many now that are yeah. forming some within, you know, the auspices of department of local health departments. But also like the one in Davis County is really being, was, you know, spearheaded by the Bountiful Community Food Pantry and the school district. So I think really capitalizing on those local efforts that are already folks who are already working on that, those issues. I, and, and just making sure that we're connecting with what's happening on the local level, because I think that is where it's, it's, I, you know, not only could we be building a group of people who are interested in food access issues on all levels, but then it's also an opportunity to um, turn them into advocates to help accomplish some of our legislative goals. And they would be here and legislators could be hearing from local constituents instead of, you know, just the folks who are at this table. Yeah, I think that's good. And they need to be here. You know, we've, we talked about if we can get enough of them setting aside time in the agenda for them to tell us what's going yeah. on. Because mm -hmm. again, they're more on that local level. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Would they be overseen by the Utah Local Food Advisory Council no. or anything? But they could be on the council, like members of the, of the other council. They could attend, like me. We, yeah, we like the Ogden Food Council. So, yeah, we, yeah. we just attend to know what's going on. Yeah, That's how Iowa, Maryland, Virginia, and other states, Michigan, have it, is that they attend the meetings, but they do not serve or have a voting or non-voting membership. I can talk a little bit more about that, and I've been given toolkits and all sorts of resources. Yeah. I have emails and a lot oh, of yes. data. Please share. <laughs> yeah, see, in some councils, not being on the council would be kind of a negative, but we're such an open council that, I mean, we don't vote on a ton of stuff. It's not to discount voting members. It's very important. But it wouldn't it wouldn't be weird to have them just join as the public because they'd have just as much voice as the public is, as they would be on a voting group. The uniqueness of the, the council itself is the fact that it's first established by statute. We have the names of those who can be voting members and how they're appointed and everything else. But we realize that the agriculture and food community in the state of Utah is far, far wider and broader than that, it covers 29 counties, all with unique issues. GPS signal lost. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, I just got lost. <laughs> I, I can't I can't follow home. No, it's good. Uh, anyway, uh, I think the one thing is is that we want to do, we want to encourage people to attend. We want people to have a voice. That's the reason we've set up, and, and we'll get into that in a minute, our our, yeah. our new subcommittee type structure. Okay, so to keep going, we only have after this one more question, but to keep going with this question, um, one again being unified in lobbying efforts, sharing information about the local food community. You know, we've had a Facebook page up, and Facebook's really great, and it looks great, and it's been awesome. But we just need a little bit more. We do need to look into paid advertising, paid promotion, paid yeah, paid media. Go to the next slide. I think it's media relations. Yeah, I media relations. Public, right? I have a state of for me, Top Up Radio, willing to do a story for us. Cool. Um, our efforts. And they have a specialty yep. crop grant. So <laughs> it was interesting. A couple of weeks ago, the Tribune, in one of their, I think it was their uh, Thursday morning edition, mm -hmm. they actually talked about local food farming and what the challenges are. It highlighted uh, one of the farms down in uh, Santa Quinn, down in uh, Utah County. Mm -hmm. So really an interesting article that was written. So there is there is interest in doing it. We just have to establish because people are out there, to, they want to learn. And, and we know there's a lot of backyard farmers and we know that there's a lot of young people that would love to get into farming, but they have absolutely no idea how to begin. Yep. And I can so, get phone calls probably on a weekly basis, if not more often, on story ideas and who to interview yeah, and what topics are interesting for agriculture and then how do I get those assigned out. And then they get picked up by a lot of our different media through our journalism connections and their network that they have. And so I've been kind of impressed with the uptick of articles. And even Utah Public Radio hires one of our interns to do the agriculture reporting. Yeah. And I think, too, like a big thing is we have like kate said a lot of these people don't even know where to go so we need to tell them how to get there basically we need to, we need to take what we're sending out to them right so and we'd love to help with that too. i mean matt hargraves uh, communications guy is constantly getting calls from newspaper radio tv whatever looking for producers looking for stories i don't claim to know much about that but i don't need to be very very source to help and that's where too as members like feed that to us feed it to us like we're happy to send it out or if, you know if we can identify some communication lines sambria welcome if we're, getting, <laughs> if we're getting if we're getting this kind of comment about the question and everything else i'm just wondering the uh, local agricultural folks they probably get even more than that not only about weeds and what does this leave for? What is this really? What is this plant that's growing wild in my yard? What is it really? More than that, the extensions probably get a lot of questions mm -hmm. asked of that. If we could get them to share that back with you, and then we could share that all over. And I share most of that through our social media already because uh, I'm pretty well linked into all of those questions and gardening ideas and I get the emails on the themes for what people are looking for for information and then I kind of look and say is there any way that we can tie on to that and share but I would like to see more participation from our group members than just extension our farm bureau or some um, of our farmers that have shared their stories I know Tamara, Bjorn, Jordan, uh, Jack, um, and others have provided photos and ideas and gave us pitches, but I love more because we need to feed the content. Well, it's kind of nice because I think, you know, Gina, your idea of doing the mm -hmm. Farm Bill Forum, that's like a major recruitment piece yeah. too for the Oh, yeah, huge. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I think one of the things also is that on the county level, the food security mm -hmm. councils that are being put together by the health departments, mm -hmm. probably they need to invite the uh, agricultural people in the county as well, and and have them be part of that because then that it unites everything, it ties it more together than just looking at, at this group of people that are not getting the food. It's how do we get that food to them and working with the local yeah it, extension look, agent is maybe a way to make that integrate that into a way that could happen. Is that possible, Kelsey? 
I can let, definitely invite county agents because I'm on the county agent list. Server. I just can never promise who will do it because of how they have kind of their goals for their county and they work with their commissioners and different partnerships. But I do see a lot of our extension agents really connecting with farmers markets, CSAs, community gardens, growing farm to school programs now. Um, there's even been more collaboration and, and a little bit of work on like, why are our agriculture education programs and extension programs maybe not um, as close, uh, like connected and helping and sharing with each other. And there is uh, some research being done on that with extension and with our culture education, our state. And so I think inviting them to the table and getting them to know and make connections. And a lot of times it was just through emails or phone calls and then finding out that the price was able to create a farmer's market because our county agent was willing to take the efforts to bring everybody together. And now they have this amazing group of farmers helping lead it with the health department and others. So it was sometimes just introducing and networking that I think has really helped out and seeing that growth in, I would say, the last four years. And yeah. We probably want to invite, invite them, them to that symposium so they become part of the whole discussion and issue and then those that can make it or send people or listen in or find ways to connect and still be aware of it so they can then be sharing it in their communities i think that's something that can be done i can never just guarantee that all all of our agents would jump on board though it's so great this discussion as, as we're trying to figure out what everybody was telling us as we go around the table and, and we listen from everybody here the energy that is being created the exchange of ideas is just Mm -hmm. That's an exciting part about this whole council. Yes. It seems like it could be really helpful to have one person assigned the role of a media relations coordinator within the council. Mm -hmm. I, my gut says that each person, it's your first instinct to represent the organization that you primarily work for rather than the local food advisory council itself, or even making a note to say, like, I'm speaking on behalf of the local food advisory council in addition to your business or your agency. Otherwise, idea. I think it's so easy just to revert to your own. And see, that's what I do for our social media. I never represent myself. I represent only the council and their viewpoints and making sure our information is not but I think tied to that. In addition to like setting goals, that could be a really exciting thing to work towards of like each month, pick one thing that the council is working on and do media pitches with that. I know time is limited, but that could pay dividends in bringing more community awareness to the council. You could use my intern to do that. And I think it's a good thing that you mentioned roles, and Senator Davis is going to talk about that, but that goes into the last question of the survey. We're looking in the future of having more defined roles for council members. So more defined roles for voting members. Obviously, the efforts of the council are led by voting members, but more defined roles by voting members, and then more defined roles for the public who attend as well, who represents a lot of people who are in this room. So this feedback goes for not just voting members but for all people who are members of this community um but speak up you know be present offer suggestions one thing that was said from several comments was bring your organizational insight and background so everybody here is an expert in what they do so if you really know a lot about agriculture bring that perspective distribution being a nonprofit association government lobbying things like that so bring that to the table and and speak up next slide and then to that word again that I keep throwing around, but leveraging the resources that are brought to the table by each person. So, you know, maybe leverage Garrick's resources to connect with more producers or, you know, maybe when we have more, you know, Lori joining, how can we connect with more um, farmers who need to have distribution or how can we work with maybe Utah Zone or another organization to connect more with consumers? How can we work with our legislators to connect with legislators? Uh, but really bringing your unique perspective to the council is really important. Um, sharing information about your activities and successes. And then just the last word cloud. I like that the word help was like really big on this one. And just helping each other, helping farmers, helping the community, helping the legislators. And I feel like already the council really has that. And, you know, Senator Davis is about to go through our new structure. But um, we wanted to present these survey results just to let you know that we're on the same page as all of you. But everything that you guys said in the surveys, things that you guys have told me offline, on a phone call or email, we really feel the same way. Um, I know Representative Handy and Senator Davis really feel the same way. So, um, yeah, that was a survey. So I guess we can move on. If you guys don't have any questions. Thank Thanks you. for doing that, Sally. Yeah. You know, the one thing, uh, as we met together 
trying to figure out how do we move this forward? How do we take the next step? The energy and synergy that's been created on this council is just unbelievable. The amount of people that would really like to be a part of it is unbelievable. By statute, of course, our membership, voting membership is, is, is limited, but going beyond that, to have as much participation as we can in all of this is very, very important. One of the things we did discuss, and, and I agree with it as we get into the legislature meeting again after the pandemic, uh, we a lot of us love table talk, side talk, if you will, while a conference is going on, a meeting is going on, to be able to nudge the person next to you with an idea that you have or what you're trying to formulate, or, or maybe a little sidebar discussion is always great in any meeting, uh, except in the classroom, I guess. But, <laughs> you're welcome, Tom. Uh, but anyway, I, I find that to be very, very important. And that's the reason in person is the most important thing there is. Intercommunication is one of the most important things I think we can ever get out of meeting together with one another is, is the camaraderie that we create and, and the uh, ideas that come from that. Uh, I found out while we were doing everything online, it's too easy to be distracted to go someplace else, could be a cup of coffee while a great discussion is going on and I'm not part of it when I get back, it's over. And I, I've missed out on all of it. So it's very, very important, I think, that we meet in person as often as we can. I think uh, that's one of the things we, we're coming down with, the meetings will be held in person. Uh, voting, non-voting members with geographic limitations, you will have the opt uh, option to be able to join by video, but we really want you to join and become part of this and not figure that there's nothing else going on. And I think with live participation going on, those who, uh, because of mileage or whatever, will actually stop and say, you know, going to this meeting is really worthwhile. I've got to attend. There's too much going on. And that's, that's part of that idea also. We also understand that the pandemic is not totally over. We could have a, a surge at any time. Any variant could shut us down again, which we don't want to see. But if that happens, we'll, we're going to be flexible enough to keep open our Zoom and everything else so we can get into those meetings as well to continue on our agenda. And as we talked about the agenda, one of the things we talked about is not having presentations at every meeting, but uh, more focused on discussion. And what that brings up is the bulk of the agenda will be for the work groups to bring their ideas, their concerns, their areas of focus, and task the, task the council members and discussion topics to come out with that report and then discuss that report. It's really getting that energy out of what you're doing uh, in what we've called uh, our subcommittees, ad hoc subcommittees. We want to define that just a little bit deeper, a little bit stronger than we have. We want as much participation in the community as we can, not just voting members and not just attendees uh, because of the organizations and things like that. We want to draw as many people into these discussion groups as we can with ideas uh, because we know from our first five years that the synergy that's created by discussion among people just really creates, uh, I mean, if, if we hadn't have started talking about school food security, we probably never would have had the discussion and the bill moving forward and the energy that we have in that. We probably, without the discussion on just food availability, probably never would have had a task force last summer that was set up to listen to hunger problems in the state of Utah. The idea of a food hub would never even have got off the ground if we hadn't have been able to have that discussion here in, a, in our distribution. So what we really want to do is put up uh, is, is fine line our subcommittees and uh, set those up. Uh, and the meetings, you know, we should be looking at, at the end of every one of our meetings or every one of these presentations from our subcommittees to have some action items that we move forward on that we can put down and, and, and you know, we come up with four or five great good ideas just in our discussion today. And it's been kind of open just on the questions that we ask uh, everybody 
uh, the survey questions that we ask has created a lot of new ideas and, and new energy. So we really want to keep that going. Um, so the agenda items, I know we've set a couple of items on the agenda already for next meeting, but we want you to set the agenda coming out of these subcommittees. What is the agenda as we talk as a group? How much further do we want to explore the ideas that came from those subcommittees? Because every committee is going to have great ideas. And how do we expand on those to make, to make them work? And uh, what we want to do is set up four work groups instead of five. Uh, with hybrid uh, group focused on production and distribution, kind of put that together. So we're, so we're talking on the same page when we talk about the distribution, not only the getting of food, but also that distribution of that food. And uh, so that's one of the groups we want to do. We want to do one on regulation. We think regulation is a very, very important thing. We've got so many layers of, of regulation that comes down from the state, regulations that come down from local county governments and cities ordinances and and also from the federal government there's a lot of programs that the feds are offering that uh, according to uh i believe it was representative ferry when he spoke to the group a couple of years ago he was using monies from the feds that nobody knew about when i talked to ron johnson down in boulder and what he's doing down there the key lining i think is what it's called nobody knew about that so those are issues that we can revitalize the land. One of the things that the money was spent on uh, for the ag, or ag and natural resources to look at is soil quality. And those issues that, that really get right back down to the soil. How do we make sure that we can grow, maximize the amount of growth in the state of Utah soil? That was one of those issues that came out. That was an issue that we talked about briefly here as well. So to say just our legislation didn't pass, but some of the ideas that have come out of this uh, uh, commission have really been able to put together some good ideas that have, have, have grown roots to look at how we get production up in the state of Utah. Another one, uh, and regulations, and we want to do that, and we want to talk farm to table. How do we get food from the farm? How do we get it to the table? And what are the, what are the issues and barriers that we have in place stopping that from happening? And of course, food security. Hunger is, is, is a major issue in the state of Utah. Being able to capitalize on as much agriculture as we can to sustain ourselves locally is far greater. And uh, so those are the things that we're looking at. We want them to be led by a member, a voting, or it could be a non-voting member, as a matter of fact, any one of these committees. And what that, that task of that individual who would be running the committee would be to manage the workshop, pull everybody together to be able to uh, communicate goals and objectives, set up the meetings as well as those agendas, determine the action and items and delegate them to the team members. In other words, it's, it's actually to get more people involved, not just having a top down, but we want this to really be a bottom up council where we listen to what's going on. And, and as a non-ag guy with a little backyard agricultural growth thing that I learned from my grandparents, beyond that, I can tell you is the fact that I learned so much and I want to continue to learn and, and how to do things. And, and some of the ideas that we take and discuss in the legislature come from the grassroots, come from here. So we want to energize and we want to really emphasize that what we want is really to see this council grow and have input into hunger problems in the state of Utah and help solve them. And so we then call upon all of these four subcommittees to give a, a review of what they discussed at their meetings in the last month, bring those ideas forward throw them out on the table so we can all have a hit at it and try to figure out what's going on and what those ideas are. Try to grow those into something that's gonna have action and those become our action items, of course, as we bring that up through the synergy of this of this council that I love so much. So anyway, that's that's kind of 
our goals. Any questions on, on what our our goals and meeting meeting objectives are? Saying not, I guess. I guess we've talked to the death. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully not. Uh, so now, uh, and, and does anybody have a problem with meeting in person? I think as long as there's an option to join remotely, if if need be, I mean, you know, like you said, not knowing what's going to happen. Yeah, mm -hmm. just I think with the uncertainty, I I mean, it's so weird to be a person and to like be this far from someone. <laughs> if you well, and if you have to see people's faces. But if if there could be the option to meet remotely, if you know if need be, if you're stricken with the variant, always use. Yes. Okay. Don't come to meeting with a mask on. Just <laughs> just <laughs> just a tip. Yeah. There's, there's um, people from rural of Utah have mm -hmm. mentioned how they've been much more included. Yes. Throughout yes. the pandemic, because of the mm -hmm. Zoom option. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the important. option I'm thinking is we want to engage more farmers, ranchers, and individuals that have conversations in their counties. We might have to find ways to uh, be lenient on them having to drive here. And, and so maybe offering that Zoom option to still participate in ways. I know it made it possible for Reagan Emmons to participate. And then we were able to take that to our constituents and our partners and organizations as we are working with them. But that wouldn't be possible for her to probably drive that far uh, to the meetings uh, when you live in the vernal area. And it's probably the case for a lot of others where it's just maybe a way to make sure that we bring everybody to the table. But sometimes driving might not be as feasible. Because I'm also thinking about some of our farmers during cabbing season, during um, October. Yeah, I know, right? Course, they might need to. Staff following up on that. Yes. Yeah. Can the subcommittees, can we Zoom those subcommittees? Can we do Zooms on our work? Can we do that? Like have the meetings, those groups meet virtually? Have those groups mm -hmm. meet, and if it needs to be virtual, some of them, that we can do that virtually. Okay, yeah. So okay, as long as we can option. do that, that makes that option yeah. really, really, that will, you're right. And then People it's just, from San Juan, it's a five hour drive yeah. up here for an hour and a half meeting. Exactly. And then to include them in the conversation, to hear their voice, to make sure that they can share something with us, I just find that more valuable because I'm afraid that the transportation, the cost of gas, some of the situations with COVID, those are all like preventive situations that would make someone go, you know what, that drive isn't worth my time for this meeting. I would have loved to participate. I just can't do it. And that means our managers, as they set up their meetings, mm -hmm. what they have to do is coordinate with Cali to make sure that you can get that Zoom presentation mm -hmm. done okay. and everything else. And, and I think that gives us the really a hard start on all of these. Because mm -hmm. I, I, I think the input is, is something that is just remarkable. I mean, the things that we've learned, the things that have gone forward in the legislature just off this council, in, in just general discussion that I've had with other members on, on what I've learned here. It's fantastic. Uh, the one thing is uh, what I'd like to look at also on all of these uh, subcommittees is diversity. I'd like to reach out to as many different people as you can, get as many different people involved as you can, uh, growers, and, and, uh, as well as those who need help and what those problems are in those communities because there's different communities now throughout the entire state of Utah. We aren't one homogenous society anymore. So we have to take a look at that and try to figure out how, how we can advance to make the state grow, make it very agriculturally friendly. And I know one of those issues is going to be water, which was brought up in one of those discussions. And that's, that's probably in that farm to table uh, discussion is what, what's the impediment to farming to getting that food to the table. That's a, that's a very important discussion. Uh, wildfire season, all of this stuff that, that we, we're facing all of these problems today with. And uh, hopefully we'll get back to where the health departments are respected a little more highly than they are today. That's, a, that's an editorial comment. <laughs> so, thank you. Um, any questions, any, any concerns about the structure of these? Are, are you thinking, who wants to be chair? Do I have a volunteer? Are there any volunteers on the, uh, to manage these work groups, the hybrid 
uh, the group of production and distribution. I think we'll, I have a list of people who opted in. I can okay. go over that with you. Okay, we'll do that at our next at our next uh, meeting, the executive committee meeting, and um, see what we can do. Then reach out, ask you all to serve, maybe make some assignments, and everything else. I hope we've we've got everybody in the room here. I hope we've got everybody's uh, information. Yes. So we can reach to them as well, mm -hmm. and make sure they're included. And uh, Ruby and Jack. Uh, that they get this information as well. Cool. Right. So I think one thing that would be helpful, just yes. because in the past we've talked about the diversity. I know Governor Cox has really asked the councils. So that's like a big thing they've sent out to the councils is to try and diversify a little bit. It'd be nice to know from your guys' perspective which group should be represented. I know I went on kind of a rabbit hole to get the tribes involved, and that kind of led to not knowing if that would be the right fit, just because. It's kind of unique. You have to go through a tribal liaison um, to do it the right way, to do it how the state wants you to do it. Each department has a tribal liaison. You go through the liaison, the liaison goes to the tribe. So things like that, we've thought about bringing those groups in, but um, it might be nice to get your guys' perspective. Yeah, you they're doing some really cool stuff. Yeah. Reagan, um, who last name I... Oh, you think Rob Skunkowski from yeah, San Juan she's, County? She's doing some great work yeah. down in San Juan County. She's, she's a specialty prop, right? Yeah, she's yeah. and she's going to, I know I remember actually reviewing yeah, her we're doing application. It. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's right. But since then, we've had some follow-up with her. We did a, a, a stakeholder meeting down in San Juan County last year, and she and some other tribal members came to um, the stakeholder meeting. So they're doing some really interesting, great food security work down in San Juan. Um, there are some farm bill issues around the food distribution program to Indian reservations, wanting some changes to that. So I think that it would be, I would wholeheartedly support getting some um, tribal government representation. You know, I, I take a look at our refugee population. It's all kind of centered in this core, there's an awful lot of these individuals who have come to this country who are agriculturists to begin with. They are being introduced into rural Utah to be able to work agriculture for their income and their future. That's probably something we need to be more inclusive with is to try to get uh, some of these refugees who are agriculturists to be able to, to start ranching and farming and and bringing some of their culture with them and, and doing that because there's a lot of ideas. Yes, please. Also, including like the Hispanic community. I know there are quite a few um, Hispanic producers out in Utah County that mm -hmm. we could definitely bring to the table as yes. well. Would you go to the chamber to reach out to those farmers? Is that the best, like the Hispanic chamber? Potentially. Um, I know. Um, I I know someone who's on the Utah Farm Bureau um, who like knows a couple of contacts there that I don't. I can reach out to them. Maybe they know, but. Um, but yeah, that's it's a good way to reach out to the Chamber of Commerce. The sure. International Rescue. Mm -hmm. they, they are, they're the best with refugee farmers. Oh, and so James Hunter. Uh, and James Hunter. Hunter. Because James Hunter comes. The there. And with IRC, yeah. probably Spice Kitchen, too. Yeah. Yes. Um, so just like thinking outside the box of other individuals to invite to the table to not have Hunter feel like he's the only one. But he could bring in some of the farmers and invite them to join in the conversation if they're comfortable with that. or. Spice Kitchen, some of their businesses, um, that might be interesting. I know they did their first CSA that accepted Snap and Double at Food Bucks, and I worked with them on that, and they had some really um, good feedback, but also some requests for help on things. And so just continuing to invite them to the table so they... Yes. Comes to food security work too um, for the Ogden Food Council. We have a Hispanic church that has a pantry, so it's more combination of faith based and food security from the um, for our Hispanic population in Ogden. Um, yes. Selena Willie from Utah State University. She is our Hispanic representation for extension, and she has connections for the whole state. Uh, and she has meetings, events. She runs the Latinx Center. We have so uh, we have some others I can think of that are very tight knit and have most of their state representation for Hispanic population residents and and how they're already connected into it and maybe how they could help us reach out to them and invite them to the table. Would be helpful probably for me is if 
you guys who have those contacts, if you want to just email intro mm -hmm. those people to me, just so yeah. that like just email them, hey, this is Callie, she oversees whatever. I can make sure they're all added. I think for the for the tribes, just because I know the process, especially mm -hmm. from us, is a little unique. I'll I'll reach out to our tribal liaison. Yeah. Um, just make sure we're doing it the way. No, like, you, yeah. But yeah. other than that, it, yeah. you have to do it. Now. Other than that, if you guys have contacts, anything you guys just said, feel free to call, like just send them an intro to me, and then I can do I can add them to things. So, does that sound good? Okay. Thanks, Cal. Interesting. Cool. All right, that sounds like we're going to move forward on that. In June, we'll have some action, and and hopefully we'll be able to put uh, these groups together in the meantime. And, and start getting you together to be able to start meeting uh, and and start growing those. Yeah, I think the idea was after this meeting, if any of you, and I don't, did we want to limit the chairs just to members or were we interested in maybe having I think, I think the one thing else is if, if, if we do have voting members mm -hmm. who want to lead these different, that's probably where we should begin and then reach down beyond that, beyond the voting members, because we want everybody to participate. And I would say the structure, we have a manager, but that doesn't stop the management of those uh, subcommittees, if you will, to be able to establish their own hierarchy, if you will, their, their sub, that vice chair, uh, the secretary or whatever they want to do in their organization. It's really about empowerment and being able to. Empower. I think what we were gonna do is Representative Hanning and yes. Senator Davis are going to take a look. So if you haven't contacted me to opt in or out, feel free to email me for either opt in or out because we don't want to assume someone can do it and just uh, appoint them. But I think the plan was Representative Hanning and Senator Davis will appoint chairs. And then the next June meeting is going to be where the chair will have had time to go over how they want to organize that group. And then they can present on that in June. But I think we thought that the first time the work groups will actually present is August because June, you guys will know who's running what and how they want it organized. And then you guys will, whoever's part of those work groups will start meeting after the June meeting. And then August will be the first. Like, and, and we'll reach out to you also with suggested members, perhaps. Yeah. Some of the non-voting members and others that are interested in certain areas start seeding those yeah because i can send recruitment out too once you whoever the chairs are once the chairs have an idea of how exactly they want it run i can send a recruitment through my list which of course you guys all have your own list serves as well <laughs> so okay I, any other questions all right all right let's let's try this uh, national food policy utah right. state university so I have a any student, yeah, I have a student intern who was interested in working with me on this. I eventually had a lot of students ask about how they get involved, how do they get engaged, how do you serve on committees and be a member of a council because that was not something they were really familiar with. And I, I have students really passionate about the agriculture industry in our state. And so I asked one of my interns to help dive into the National Food Policy and Advisory Council best practices. And the way that we did this with, um, was because, next slide, uh, we were hearing from our strategic planning committee and from Callie and Representative Handy and Senator Davis how we wanted to grow our council and build and grow our stakeholder involvement. We kept hearing how members wanted to be more involved. They wanted to be a part of discussions and actions and to be able to support our capacity to build our local food uh, system in our state. And I wanted to explore how that's done in other states and find some best practices that could help us consider the next steps as we were refocusing and doing a restart on our LFAC meeting, but also our work groups. So next slide. I had our student do a literature review, a meta-analysis, I guess would be the better thing. I'm trying to find all of our white papers and academic journals published in a variety of uh, open source or, or journal articles uh, with information about the formation, the success, or the learning uh, lessons learned. 
uh, from food, existing food policy councils or local food advisory councils. And there were some articles even about the dissolution of those councils and what was learned from those experiences. With uh, focusing specifically on agriculture in the United States, we identified 17 um, documents that we would analyze. But then we wanted to go a little bit further. And so I said, you know, we have a lot of contacts around the country. Let's interview a few people. Let's learn how are they doing local food advisory councils. Let's see what they've gained from these experiences. Because some of them started in 1983 and they've been in existence for a long time, and others have a restart button like the state of Iowa. And so we wanted to explore what that looked like. We only did a handful, and this is only the ones we've had analyzed up to our meeting. I'll be honest, I have a more to analyze, but we just did not get to that um, due to some of my health setbacks. So we conducted telephone interviews. We were able to interview staff as well as some suggested work group members of other local food advisory councils or statewide food policy uh, councils in Michigan, Iowa, South Carolina, North Carolina, Colorado. We also engaged with people in uh, Idaho, Nebraska, Kansas, Ohio, and a few other states, just but but that data is not part of this uh, conversation today. If you could go to the next slide, what we did was look for the overarching themes of what were best practices and lessons learned from either the articles or from the interviews and try to combine those to think about some things for us and where we want to go with our council for the next five years. And so with that, I just want to share some ideas about the strong leadership the intentions of the council and work groups, ways to communicate and foster communication, how to continue what we already have uh, working well with our diverse partnerships, but how we could build on some capacity building strategies. And then most importantly, a lot of them said, make sure we're measuring and evaluating our impact, not just at the council level, but also the ways our organizations are working on issues related to our council and how we can document that because some of the councils were disbanded because either the legislature or local government did not find them actually having an impact and they weren't able to show what that is. Now, I do think we've done some really great things in our state, but they had some ideas for us. So next slide with strong leadership. Mainly it came from making sure we're using key stakeholders. They suggested members of the council helping lead working groups and then have that being really vital to pro be productive conversations, keeping our legislative process moving forward, and then handling any debate or disagreement tastefully. While they love the idea of having community members, yes, I thought that was tactful, <laughs> making sure we weren't being like, arm wrestling and like so uh, there are some states where i have seen some heated debates especially about snap and the oh man and i the would bill, okay? i would love it so i have debate. seen some, <laughs> seen, yeah some, some words used i guess is how i describe it um but what I thought was interesting is they said, well, we want to invite all the community and we want to have as many people in the working group if they are less familiar with the council structure and its goals and its priorities. Sometimes that makes it harder for them to lead or to be accountable to reporting to the council. So I thought that was interesting. But um, they also deal a lot with diversity, equity, and inclusion, and how to make sure our, our work groups, as well as our leaders, are representative uh, of the different uh, organizations in our state. So that was something for them to just uh, to help us think about. Um, next slide, clarifying intentions. I actually thought this kind of fit nicely with a lot of the comments about goal setting and having action items or things that we could be doing. So one suggestion was um, based on the awareness of our similar and aligned work that we've done in the past year, uh, five years, and appreciating the people that have done that work, take some time to make sure that our council has a really clear purpose to help our work groups create some rules and shared values on how our council and work groups are going to work together, how, how can we make that happen. So they suggested um, setting some, some ground rules, some key values. And then the next slide will uh, suggest having a strategic work plan. 
something that's going to be valuable to make sure our council and our work groups have some priorities, but some goals. And they said, you know, if you're thinking about five year period of time, uh, think about some short term, medium term and long term strategies of what we could be working on so that we can continue through the pipeline of five years instead of resetting every year, thinking about timely uh, topics that we could be a part of. So they really thought about creating a plan of work to help direct our actions and the time for what we take and do um, during our work groups, uh, making sure that we look at any gaps in uh, what we're doing and do some asset assessment. What do we already know about our agriculture industry, where our strengths are and our knowledge, but where are there some gaps where we can be inviting people to those conversations and helping us? Be able to think about our priority um, and policies, which it seems like we already have some um, that we would like to uh, commit to, such as our farm to school appropriation, as well as maybe some ways that we could be addressing food security, maybe even revisiting Utah's farmers market network. How could we be looking at some of those needs, but also thinking about things like agritourism and drought and irrigation. So some of those topics and how we can bring that to the plan. But then make sure our work groups actually have tasks that they can be responsible for with our members and align to our council's priorities and make sure our council meetings uh, have like a non um, adversarial forum where everybody can just share and be collaborative towards some common goals, which we do really successfully, but a few states said that they had some issues with that. Well, maybe we um, don't have the, all the right people. All, that's exactly it. And, and it came up in Iowa, uh, and I'm going to bring up this a little bit later, because there are very conventional, traditional agriculture system, but still has a very strong growing local food movement. And they didn't want to be competing against each other, but bringing in all of those conversations. So they were inviting people from the pork producers and the uh, poultry producers and uh, the corn growers and, wheat growers and others into this conversation that you may not consider local food, but having them uh, align with each other, with our farm bureaus too, because of how they have such great connections already with the legislature and with uh, farmers and ranchers who we want to see more participation of in this group. So I just thought that was uh, an interesting comment because that got me to think and say, okay, well, we don't typically have that. We're usually very collegial and excited and bring a lot of enthusiasm. But that also brings uh, the idea of do we have everybody at the table um, in that conversation. And so next slide talks about fostering communication. And so uh, doing more communication, communicating about different issues to and from the council and to, with our work groups, sharing information with our stakeholders. There are some great ideas for how to do that. Some have a listserv, some had a website, others had social media. We have a, a um, a Facebook page has about 200 followers. I would love to see that grow knowing that we have some groups, but I will tell you right now, I looked at the room of what organizations we have as members, and I know the member organizations that don't even follow our own social media. So that's alarming to me as a communicator, because if you want to be at the table communicating, you should be also willing to share what is happening uh, so the council can promote, but also the council can promote what you're doing. Some of that can also uh, lead to providing some opportunities for us to present recommendations, solutions to our county officials, making sure our county commissioners and our legislators are aware of some of the uh, topics that are important to our local food system. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about how some councils do that in community building strategies. Um, next slide though. Continuing our diverse partnerships, I was really excited to see how well we do this. Um, but something Iowa said was that their political and conventional agriculture partnerships may be the most important of all of their partnerships when they formed. This was also said in North Carolina. 
because the state was dominated by really conventional production agriculture, but they have agritourism and they have a local food movement that includes food as well as wine and alcohol. So they wanted to find ways to build those conversations. So not only did they have the organic growers and the small medium scale growers and the urban farmers, but they had some conventional groups beyond just Farm Bureau participate in those conversations because they are strong advocators and lobbyists and they have great connections already with the legislature. And if they can have an understanding for the importance of this, then they can help us and being able to share that information um, by getting us introductions or by helping us uh, be able to share information. Uh, we do a really awesome job already uh, having ideas uh, represented from diverse sectors. But then they said, make sure we're identifying and engaging stakeholders that aren't in the room yet. So I love the idea that you said the tribal uh, communities because North Carolina has an entire local food advisory council for just their tribes. And then they come to the month, like the meeting for the, the statewide council, and then they report on things that they're doing. And then how can we be cross promoting, supporting, knowing when to lead or when to step back and let them do that? And I thought that was really insightful because I felt like um, that was something we could learn from. And they had some great tips on how they bring those conversations um, to their meeting. And then continue with our state experts, our practitioners, our community members, though. That was something they kept saying. They brought in people who uh, were in the local councils and making sure that they were attending the meetings and had time to present and to share what they were doing so that we could learn from them because they wrote it as being on the grassroots and being more engaged maybe in actions that are changing the local food system in their community. Whereas a lot of these state groups were more about networking, education, outreach, uh, providing a voice for our culture and how we could work together as well as the ability to share ideas for legislation. Uh, and again, everybody said how important our state legislators were to this role. But something I realized is not all local food advisory councils have state legislators appointed. So I was really excited to share with them how we had three individuals that were very passionate about agriculture and that help um, advocate and propose legislation uh, with the council and how a lot of us have been able to go down to um, the legislative session and share. Uh, stories and successes and so that made me really excited when I saw that they were saying to establish it but we already have done a really great job and to know that there are states that don't have that connection and in also made me uh, realize we're very uh, fortunate in that. Uh, next slide. These are some capacity building strategies. One of the things I was so impressed with was how much Colorado, Michigan, and North Carolina were able to do at the state level that wasn't that went beyond discussion and networking, but that were, I'm gonna say, tangible items or events or activities that they did. So I asked them, what are those things that you're doing and how are you doing it? And one of the groups we got to talk to was community food strategies in North Carolina. And here are some things that they said had worked really well for them. Um, the first thing they said was that they made sure everybody on their council had some shared definition of what are projects, programs, or policies, and what that looks like and what we can be involved in. So we know how to be engaging our work group members. And then they said um, that also helped with capacity building so that we were creating strategies or action items that we're going to help our council grow. And so making sure we know what type of work is appropriate was something they said really helped with that. But they also said a lot of councils participate in community engagement. They're doing things like information sharing, uh, exchanging ideas, networking, but educating and advocating and advising their decision makers uh, beyond just a council meeting through events. So similar to the form that you just discussed and shared as an idea with um, the farm bill was something a lot of statewide councils are doing. If we could go to the next slide though, I don't wanna skip this. They were saying how important it was for group leaders to have monthly agendas, 
and be able to report on the work that they're doing, but to make sure that we go back quarterly or however frequently we meet uh, to share ideas and to use this time to present some strategies, some solutions, but also for requests on legislation so that we can work far enough in advance on issue briefs, videos, and ways that we can help educate our legislature uh, in preparation for our season. And, and that way we might see even more success with our uh, requests. Next slide. This was something I never thought about, but I found it was really interesting. They suggested that, especially for work groups and for committee members um, that are not familiar with policy literacy or capacity building, do some training on what that looks like and how to design and implement it. And North Carolina has an entire kit available for free on how that's done. And they've offered it to us if we want to use it. But it just provided us some um, guidelines so that we have realistic expectations of what we can do in a year. So we can have reported actions and outcomes in our annual reports to the legislature. So that was something I did not think about, but I found valuable. And I saw that in a lot of the journal articles, as well as some of the conversations um, with our council representatives. Next slide. It seems like we're really interested in engagement and getting members to do things. So here's some ways that that's done. Um, they're doing information exchanges. That's forums, meetings, presentations, using their social media, emailing their listservs, doing newsletters. Colorado went as far as having a website created with all of the council members listed, all of the information, the work groups, some of the priorities. And then as they create their content, they're publishing it there uh, beyond just having something available on the state website for public uh, knowledge. So I thought that was interesting. I don't know if we want to go that far, but they said that was really effective for them uh, to let people see what they're doing. They also suggested um, doing some advising with decision makers and meeting with them to help make sure they understand what's a food hub, what's farm to school, but not just have us talk about it, have farmers and their districts talk about it so that they see it coming back from their constituents and making it more powerful because of who would vote and support them. Uh, but what I was surprised about are that fewer councils are set up to design food system solutions or to implement projects. A lot of them are here to do discussion, big ideas, legislation, policy help, but maybe not boots on the ground grassroots. They were saying that's where they were seeing the most success at the county or city level. Next slide. Um, some other ideas, they have created fact sheets, issue briefs. So uh, in preparation of the legislation season, they had like a two page outline of all the key things that they wanted somebody to know. Then they would design a video and they'd have material kind of packaged ready to go for a conversation about the, the issue with the legislation. Um, supporting more outreach and educational events, thinking about how we can partner within our networks to um, help inform our local government and institutions, our schools, our farmers and ranchers on important actions or activities that we can be doing. A lot of them hosted those activities. And one of the things they said was host candidates around the state during election season or before legislative season and let them understand more about the issues that they're asking um, to be voting on or to help support because that made a difference uh, for their outcomes. Uh, the next slide is really the last idea they asked. I asked about how they're evaluating their impact knowing that we do an annual report. And some of them just said it's simple, doing surveys, gathering data on ways that we're collaborating at the local, regional, state levels that support our council, but it may be from the roles that we hold at our own organizations or institutions and finding a way to maybe link those together to build off of the success we've had with Double Up Food Bucks or our social media or some of the effort, efforts we've made. 
And so uh, thinking of how we can document that, they even said interview, success, uh, interview people for success stories and then use that for media pitches and to use that to invite um, for social media and to be able to share it. But then you could also have like snippets in the report about what those success stories are so that we're showing work of our work group members going beyond just our council, but how we're taking back what our council does. And then I think the last thing that was kind of, I don't know, interesting was when they think about the collective impact, they said, think about this question. How do you assess when your council should lead or when your work group should take the lead or when should you sh just show up and offer support? So if you know Kate's doing an Apple Crunch event and it's at one of the schools, could our council show support by attending that and then inviting some people to attend? If we're doing an event at the legislature and we know that we're having people come testify, rather than just have those individuals who testify, have more of the council members and work group members show up and support so they can see mass numbers supporting behind that one person talking just to help maybe bring in more impact, but also be able to document numbers, how many people, how many organizations, what organizations are attending, because that can sometimes help show um, the collaborative efforts and the ways that we're sharing our resources and coming together, which a lot of us have said that's something we want to do. So in summary, strong leadership, keep our diverse partnerships, continue to make communication, if not improve on it, and find some ways we could do capacity building within our work groups so that we're engaging our members, but also community members and our stakeholders. And that seems to be some key things that have helped with statewide local food advisory councils. Thank you, Kelsey. I hope this has been Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, I it wasn't think, more visual. And I think, I think the one thing is, is as you've heard, as we've laid out our ideas going forward, a lot of these things we've encompassed yes. into where we're headed and what and we're going to do. That surprised me because like we did that and we started that work like in January after our December meeting and then like to see how things came through on the survey that just was done in the last mm -hmm. week and going, that's cool. Like that's interesting to we're, see that we're not that far off. And we're not that far off. Exactly. And some of those contemporaries existing since 1983 was really impressive mm -hmm. to me. But knowing that we have some just starting in 2021 or restarting mm -hmm. because they took a gap is also interesting. So we're going to take, uh, and uh, Representative Handy and, and Kelly, we're going to sit down and we're going to figure the chairs, offer the chairs to certain people, voting members to begin with, that we know are involved. and. Uh, if we're turned down there, we'll go we'll to the non-voting members and expand it out from there because we want the energy. The one thing that we've established on this uh, council is the fact that we have an awful lot of synergy. We want to encompass, we want, we really want to put our arms around it, bring it forward into really great collaboration that we can then move forward as some of these states have and, and, and set our goals and have that done. This isn't something that's going to be done this year. We've got five years. Uh, of reauthorization. I think it probably take us a couple of years mm -hmm. to really get into where we're really solid. So it's really, uh, I, I can tell you, beyond June 28th, I'm hoping to continue to be chair. So anyway, uh, our next meeting is in June. It'll be June 23rd at uh, one o'clock in the afternoon. In this room again. In this room again. And uh, those online, uh, it's great and uh we want to invite you we want to invite all of you and and if you have friends or colleagues that you think should be involved in this please bring them along that we really want to share our ideas and have their ideas shared back with us to only grow and make uh, farm to food really a, a visible aspect in the state of utah we want to get it for 15 percent we want to get up a few more percentage points in the state of Utah to make sure that we have product here and, and fresh produce, especially in our schools and our pantries, and then everybody has the opportunity to have it. So, and, and 
address the food islands that we have to the same degree. So, thank you. You're here to close the formal way. Okay, I need a motion. I move to adjourn. I will take a second on that. I will second. Okay, and I have a second from Kelsey. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, and we will see you in two months. Please get cookies and bread. If you don't know, if you know what things are, let me know, but don't leave without a plate. <laughs> or two. I thought the cookies are just too bad. Yeah.